Introducing Royal Caribbean's newest ship, Icon of the Seas, the ultimate family vacation. The ultimate six slides, eight neighborhoods, zero compromise vacation. The ultimate never done that, can't wait to do it vacation. The ultimate chillin' by a different pool every day of the week vacation. This is the Icon of Vacations. Icon of the Seas, arriving in 2024. Book today. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. I'm Dana Perino. Join me for my brand new podcast, Perino on Politics. As we analyze the 2024 election cycle, make sure you subscribe to this series on foxnewspodcast.com or wherever you download podcasts and leave me a rating and review. Food Heals Podcast, episode 294. There's a big misconception that women are going to get huge if they start lifting heavy weights. First of all, women are just not designed to get that big because you don't have the testosterone that men do have. If you're looking at like weight loss, 90% of it's your diet. Yeah. Well, by building of muscle is only going to make your metabolism faster and able to store more calories and glucose in your muscles. So you actually, you're going to lose the weight. You're going to lose the fat. How many nutrient dense whole plant foods can you get on your plate in one day? Mm -hmm. When you're getting all those nutrients in your body, that's when your body can kind of let go of the extra body fat. I lost all this weight and had this incredible amount of energy. So my diet now is plant-based. I just believe that food healed me. I always tell people, I'm like, I am literally just a fat guy that ate a bunch of apples. (laughs) (laughs) Holistic Voice presents the Food Heals podcast with your hosts, Alison Melody and Susie Hardy. Join the Food Hills Nation and learn the secrets to go from feeling unwell to healing yourself. Warning, side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, an increase in sexual activity, feelings of joy, cravings for kale and quinoa, and a spike in Tinder matches. In rare cases, people have experienced a strong desire to put down the Ben & Jerry's, get off the couch, and take a walk outside. If you experience any of these symptoms, tell your Facebook friends immediately. All right, welcome, Food Heals Nation. Thanks for joining me. I'm Allison Melody. Today, we are continuing on our journey to help you stay healthy in 2020. This is our third episode in our wellness and weight loss series where we're playing our favorite clips from some of our guests' most inspiring weight loss journeys. And it's my intention and hope that hearing these stories helps you stick to your 2020 goals in February and beyond. And the reason I wanted to do this series is because I know so many of us have struggled or are struggling with our weight, our relationship to food, how we feel about our bodies. There's a lot of shame around our choices. And so many of us are fed up with feeding our feelings with food, body shaming ourselves, and we're sick of looking in the mirror and not loving what we see. It's time to change that. Make 2020 the year that is different. So maybe you've been a yo-yo dieter most of your life. You're feeling that shame when you look in the mirror. You found yourself using food as reward. You feel like you've tried everything to lose the weight and nothing has worked. And you're frustrated with yourself for not being able to figure the F out. I get it. You are not alone. Growing up, I never felt good enough. I would look at all the beautiful girls around me and all I could think about was how much better they they were than me. They had better hair, they were taller, they were thinner, they were more athletic, the list goes on and on. Because I didn't feel beautiful, I didn't feel worthy. And then it's like cut to college. My diet was like Taco Bell, Wendy's, bad cafeteria campus food. I put on the dreaded freshman 20 pounds and it just perpetuated the cycle of shame of not feeling good enough and looking at everyone else and going, why do I look like this when other people don't look like me? And food became comfort. Food became reward. Food soothed the stress. Food helped me with depression. It helped me overcome breakups. It cured those nasty hangovers that you would get from all night drinking in college. And when I looked in the mirror, I literally would tell myself I wasn't good enough, I wasn't pretty enough, and I wasn't lovable. And that was a cycle that went on for years. And so much happened during that time. A lot of you know my story, losing both of my parents to cancer, which just perpetuated a lot of self-loathing and destructive behavior and sadness and depression and spiraling, right? And it wasn't until I discovered the tools to heal myself emotionally and spiritually that everything 
changed, okay? So I was eating right, I was doing my vegan thing, but I wasn't there yet. I had to do the emotional work, I had to do the spiritual work, I had to get present with myself, I had to cultivate practices of self-love, and that's when everything changed. You know, I finally lost the weight. I lost those last effing 10 pounds that wouldn't go away. I stopped comforting myself with food. I stopped binging on Netflix and eating, you know, garbage that wasn't serving me. Even if it was vegan garbage, you guys, you know, I finally stopped abusing my body with sugar. I was a former sugar addict. Okay. These are all related to my emotional issues that I hadn't dealt with. And I just finally became confident in the woman that I am today. The woman that is here hosting this podcast that has the confidence to talk to you about food, about healing, about self-love. And because this transformation was so radical for me, I want to share these tools with you. That's what my course, Food Freedom, is all about. So if you're fed up with feeding your feelings with food, you can join me for a three-week transformation that will change your life. It's all at Drop thefoodshame.com. In the Food Freedom course, which is customized for you based on what I went through and what I did to heal myself of all of these issues and to truly create a life and a body that I'm proud of and that I love and that I appreciate, um, I wanted to teach you all of the tools, right, that I have in my emotional healing toolbox to deal with this stuff. So you're going to learn the exact step-by-step process for when diet and exercise isn't cutting it. You're going to learn a process for identifying and shifting and changing your core misbeliefs around your body. We're going to talk about how to integrate trust and ease and self-love and gratitude into your daily practice. So you stop the shame in its tracks. You stop the emotional eating before you do it because you recognize when it's about to happen. You stop it, you change the pattern, and it's going to take time. We're going to work on that. That's why it's a three-week long course with daily practices that's going to go on beyond the three weeks that you're going to keep working on until it becomes a habit and then the weight starts to fall off because the truth is it's not until it's not that you'll love yourself when you lose weight it's that when you love yourself you will lose the weight does that make sense so I'm going to teach you all the steps I'm going to teach you how to stop overeating stop stress eating stop emotional eating for good get rid of the sugar addiction or whatever addictions you might find yourself in today And I'll give you the exact healing meditations and tools and processes that I use to heal myself, to love myself, and love my body. Dropthefoodshame.com. And next up, some of our favorite guests share their inspiring journeys to better health. First, Susie and I are talking to Shelby Webb about how to eat for your blood type and how Shelby lost 30 pounds, nearly one fifth of her body weight by incorporating the principles of the blood type diet and how she now helps others do the same. Roll it, Roxy. The Food Heals Podcast starts now. All right. Well, let's start at the beginning. What was your diet and your lifestyle like before you discovered the blood type diet and started to make these changes? Sure. Well, my health journey started um, around 2010. I was a senior in college. Um, I'd already been diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, but my doctor gave me essentially one treatment option, which was taking birth control indefinitely. And so I rejected that as a treatment option. I, I was overweight at the time, and I tried to remedy that by running. Um, I decided I didn't like running, um, but I hadn't made the food connection yet, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm pretty sure at the time my diet consisted of like frozen chicken and um, canned vegetables every day <laughs> and about one bazillion environmental toxins on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, I, I just wasn't eating anything fresh, you know, nothing whole, nothing fresh. Um, I was told I was pre-diabetic and of course I was seriously unhappy with my situation. So I watched um, Forks Over Knives, the documentary, yeah. Um, and then read Skinny Bitch, then mm-hmm. read Eat Right for Your Type, then Kimberly Snyder's books. Do you guys love her? Yes, I love Kimberly Snyder. And Skinny Bitch is one of the books that put me over the edge where at that point, when I read that book, I had stopped. I hadn't eaten cow's meat since I was a child. I just didn't. But that's the book that made me stop eating chicken. And, you know, I, I feel like I went on a similar path as you in terms of like changing through with all those resources, which are great. Right, right. I, I, um, that was a book that 
helped change my mind for sure. And so after I made the connection between my weight gain and the food I was eating, I lost about 20 pounds. And then um, a couple years later, I lost 10 more pounds by detoxing with the help of a naturopath. So that's awesome. Um, right. And so at, at that point, studying nutrition had become my hobby. And I thought, you know, why don't I start a career out of this instead of giving all this unsolicited advice to my friends and family um, and give it to people who actually want to hear about it. So um, I went back to school to study holistic nutrition. Mm-hmm. I quit my job and, and I started my own business as a certified holistic nutrition consultant. So that's awesome. Um, Good for you. Thank you. So tell us about the blood type diet. And I know the book is called Eat Right for Your Blood Type, correct? It's Eat Right. Eat Right for Your Type is the title. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that book was um, one of my early discoveries as well. And it basically told me for my blood type that I wasn't supposed to eat meat and I was supposed to drink a lot of interesting teas and things. And I read it a long time ago. And then I had another friend read it and she was type O and they said, and it said, you know, that's like the meat eaters um, blood type. So I thought that was really interesting. Yes. So what is your blood type? A. Your A. Okay, so am I. Okay, well, um, I'll talk about just the science for just a second, and then we'll talk about each of the blood types, and we'll definitely talk about A because that um, it's one of the most common ones. Susie, what are you? I am ashamed to say I don't know, and I had a physical over the summer, and that was one of the things. I'm like, I need to find out my blood type. Yeah. I don't know how I don't know it, but I don't, I don't know it, but, um, but I need to find out. all right we'll go on Shelby tell us all about it sure um and if you don't know what your blood type is there are at-home testing kits that are pretty handy that are about ten dollars um I can send you guys the link to that and you can test it at your house and it tells you immediately what your type is so you can go on and uh read the book if anyone's interested in doing that uh I am (laughs) (laughs) Shelby where do you get those tests are they online are they in drugstores it's on the website of um, the author of this book, which is Peter J. Dadamo. That's D apostrophe A D A M O, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, but he has the test kits on that website. Perfect. Right. Yeah. So the book E Write for Your Type came out in 1996, so almost 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but even when the book was published, it was dec- it was based on decades of research. Um, he is a naturopathic doctor, actually. His father was also a nat- naturopathic doctor um, who extensively researched blood types. What's interesting, I've learned over the years um, from being interested in blood types, is that in Japan, it's common to be asked your blood type during a job interview. Really. Or- Yes, or out on a date because they believe it defines your temperament or personality. Oh, wow. That's so interesting. That's very interesting. <laughs> now I want to know everything about I know, everyone so- I know. What type are you? <laughs> I ask people it's all like, the hey, time. Baby. It's like, hey, ask- baby, what's your sign? <laughs> exactly. So it might be like information you would include on your Tinder profile. I'm typing blood. <laughs> so you might take that with a grain of salt, the personality, uh, blood type connection, like an astrological sign, but it's still fun to learn about, and we'll get more into that later. Um, the premise, though, for the book is that your blood type determines determines what diseases you might be susceptible to, what foods you should eat, obviously, Mm -hmm. and also how you should exercise. So the term one man's food is another man's poison comes to mind because the idea is that our bodies are unique. And Mm -hmm. so identifying the foods that our bodies uh, do well with can help prevent inflammation, which is key. What happens, essentially, there's a chemical reaction between your blood and the foods that you eat. So lectins are proteins that are found in foods like legumes and grains and vegetables. And in an example of one is gluten, which we are probably all familiar with. So if you eat a food with lectins that are incompatible with your blood type antigen, the lectins target an organ or a bodily system and they begin to agglutinate, which literally means to stick or glue to um, the blood cells in that area. So the cells clump together and the body treats them like a foreign invader Mm. and your body is rejecting the lectin in that food. So using gluten as an example, the gluten binds to the lining of your small intestine and causes all this inflammation and irritation, especially for type O's. So that's why type O's should avoid gluten. Lectins in certain foods can also slow down the rate of your food metabolism, interfere with digestion, cause bloating, and other things. So in the book, 
they have organized it really well, although it's a lot of information. And each blood type is given lists for 16 food groups like vegetables and fruits. And then each food group is divided into three categories. So you'll have four fruits, highly beneficial fruits, neutral fruits, and then avoid fruits. So anything on your highly beneficial list is a food that acts like a medicine. Mm -hmm. Neutral foods are just act like foods. And then the avoid list acts like a poison in your body. And so the best policy is to take those lists and eliminate the foods that are on your avoid list and focus on eating highly beneficial and neutral foods. So let's talk about Allison's blood type first and mine's because this is type A. We flourish on a vegetarian diet because we have low amounts of hydrochloric acid. Um, And I actually had that confirmed by a naturopathic doctor who did um, biofeedback on me. Have you ever had that done, Allison? Allison. No, but I'm fascinated. Tell me everything. <laughs> yes. Biofeedback uh, will pick that up. Um, and that's something my naturopathic doctor told me. And I, I said, well, I already know that because I know about the blood type diets. But basically, type A blood folks are supposed to eliminate overly processed and refined foods. And um, the key is just to eat foods in as natural a state as possible. Um, you know, fresh, pure and organic foods. So yes. Um, The foods that encourage weight gain for us are meat, dairy, kidney beans, lima beans, and wheat in abundance. Um, And then foods that encourage weight loss are vegetable oils, soy foods, vegetables, pineapple. Um, And then another thing that's interesting is that red wine is highly beneficial for type A. So just to make sure everyone heard that, a doctor is giving you the green light to drink red wine. Susie and I just high five for everyone who's not <laughs> with us in the studio. We silently high fived because we're drinking red wine right now. No. <laughs> and Allison loves her wine. <laughs> and, and I'm not sure, giving and, it up. And it's good for her. <laughs> Clearly, Shelby just said it. Susie's like, can I change my blood type? Um, <laughs> yeah, can I? Wait, wait. Is are the other oh, well blood transfusion <laughs> <laughs> it's gotta be i love my red wine yeah so the book like i said also goes into diseases that you might be susceptible to mm-hmm. and for type a they're pretty serious heart disease cancer diabetes and so you you also have recommendations for exercise so for type a's we um need to focus on exercises that reduce stress in our lives because we <laughs> na- isn't this funny we have naturally high levels of cortisol, which is our stress hormone. And that ties into the personality connection for type A's. Have you guys ever heard like someone say, that guy is real type A as in he's a high stress individual? Mm -hmm. Yes. So it turns out there's something to that because type A's have this um, naturally high level of the stress hormone. Um, And so if we don't deal with stress, we explode. So some examples of famous type A blood people are, are you guys ready? Yeah. Adolf Hitler. Oh, God. (laughs) (laughs) Is that supposed to make me feel better or worse? (laughs) Exactly. The Uh, second was Richard Nixon. He had type A blood. All right. Third, Britney Spears. Oh, she has my birthday, too. So me and Britney are like BFF. Snap. Basically. All connected. I, mean, I, I think we can all remember their respective meltdowns, you know? <laughs> that is true. Very good point, Shelby. Very good point. <laughs> the shaved head with the umbrella, that was totally because she was a type A. That's what she should have told the judge. And so I'll just go quickly through the other types for listeners in case anyone else knows what their blood type is. First, type O, which is the most common blood type. It's also the oldest. It's a universal donor. Typos are supposed to be gluten and dairy free. They thrive on a high protein diet. So foods that encourage weight gain for typos are corn, kidney beans, navy beans, lentils, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, mustard greens. And then foods that encourage uh, weight loss are kelp, seafood, iodized salt, liver, red meat, kale, spinach, and broccoli. The diseases that typos are more susceptible to our hypothyroidism, um, which is a low level of thyroid hormone due to insufficient levels of iodine. So that's why kelp is good for typos. Um, And then also ulcers, because typos naturally have um, more stomach acid than type A's. So that's just something to note. Um, Typos do really well with 
um, high intensity aerobic exercise, so cardio. And then uh, famous O blood types that you guys will know are Ronald Reagan, our former president, Queen Elizabeth II, John Lennon, and Elvis. I like the O's way better than the A's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of A's that are nice. <gasps> Yeah, Shelby, give us some nice A's, will ya? <laughs> what about us? We're nice. I agree. I'm I gonna agree. call Allison Allison Adolf right now. <laughs> <laughs> Type A Allison Adolf. A A. Thanks for no. the new nickname, guys. <laughs> you know, guys, I have to say I I will bet I'm gonna make a prediction right now. And I don't even know about the other two blood types, but from what Shelby just said, I bet that I'm type O. Okay. From what she just said about what what they do better on with the kelp and the salt. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about the dairy, but yeah, but I bet, I bet I'm typo. All right. I'm going to make a prediction. You, let's get you tested and we then we'll tell We should take bets you. online and on our website. Yeah. What is Susie's blood type? <laughs> <laughs> I guess we have to wait and see. You should make a quiz so everyone can guess. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so interesting because it's like one of the foods you said um, that could cause a type O to gain weight is like cauliflower. And you Usually when you're eating a vegetable, you're thinking no matter what, this is good for me and I'm proud of myself for eating it. And you may not know that just for you, it's having this detrimental effect. So the whole point of this podcast and everything we're doing isn't to confuse people. It's just to say, find out what works for your body, what works for your neighbors, what works for your husbands, what works for your girlfriends, what works for your sister is not the same as what works for you. Exactly. And and so it can only help to learn yeah. this information. Um, so I, I think it's so important. Um, okay, what are some of the other types? Yeah, so the last two are type B, which their diet is really a mix of the type A and type O diets. Foods that encourage weight gain for type Bs are wheat, corn, lentils, peanuts, sesame seeds, and buckwheat. And then foods that encourage weight loss are green vegetables, meat, liver, eggs, low-fat dairy products. Um, So diseases that type Bs are susceptible to are immune system disorders like MS, Mm -hmm. lupus, chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, And their exercise should be um, activities that involve other people. So like hiking, biking, tennis, aerobics. Um, So it's exercises that engage your mind as well as your body. An interesting factoid on the personality connection for type Bs is that as of the date of this the, that this book was published in 1996, 30 to 40% of all self-made millionaires in the U.S. were type B. Damn. Whoa. Susie, I hope you're type B now. Okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe I changed my prediction. Let's make this <laughs> podcast a millionaire podcast. All right. Can you make us millions? All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, go online and vote. Is she B or O? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So famous uh, type B bl- um, people are Paul McCartney and Leonardo DiCaprio, right? Two absolute bosses. Okay, now B's the best. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> Agreed. Um, the last one is type AB. It's the um, um, most young of all the blood types. It's the rarest. Um, they're a universal receiver. Um, type Bs have low stomach acid like type As, and so they're to restrict meat consumption for weight loss also. Foods that encourage weight gain for type AB um, folks are red meat, kidney beans, lima beans, seeds, corn, buckwheat, and wheat, and then foods that encourage weight loss uh, for AB type is tofu, seafood, dairy, green vegetables, kelp, and pineapple. And the disease that they are most susceptible to is stomach stomach cancer. Um, and then their exercise um, that's recommended is yoga, hiking, and swimming. Famous AB blood types are some pretty cool people. Marilyn Monroe, JFK, Mick Jagger. So we might hypothesize that ABs have a stronger sex drive than other blood types. What do we think? Yeah, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to say yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so th- this book is so inexpensive on Amazon. But if you don't want to read the book, I, I, I get it. There is a an app in the iTunes store that you can, or excuse me, on the app store mm-hmm. that you can download. And then you can make grocery shopping list for your type specifically. And then you go over to your shopping list and see what percentage of what you're buying today is on your highly beneficial list and what's on your neutral list. And so it's a really easy way to do that. That's awesome. 
Yeah. So tell us about your journey and how the blood type diet really helped you. I was not ever a, really a meat lover. I never really was one of those people who just craved like a steak or a hamburger, right? right. Um, and I, I guess that's just, that was my body saying, that's not what you really want or need. Um, and so that was really the key to my weight loss is restricting, well, eliminating meat. Mm -hmm. um, and so I lost all this weight and had this incredible amount of energy because when you give your body the foods that it wants and needs, it doesn't require all the extra energy to deal with that food. So my diet now is plant-based, um, whole foods based with a ton of fiber and water and vitamins and enzymes, which is, are all easy to obtain from plant foods. And so th that's why I became a health coach because I just believe that food healed me yeah. um, and I want to help other people do the same thing. All right, I hope you enjoyed that clip from our episode with Shelby. To hear the rest, go back into the Food Heals archives to podcast episode number 35. All right, Food Heals Nation. Well, if you listen to this show enough, you know that I am all about getting as many servings of fresh fruits and vegetables as I can into my diet throughout my day, no matter how I get it, whether it's doing smoothies or juices or cooking the vegetables or eating the fruits raw, I am getting as much nutrition as I can into my body all day, every day. And one thing I truly try to avoid is wasting food because did you know that over 200 118 billion dollars of food goes to waste in this country every year and that includes 20 billion pounds of produce and that's why I'm excited to tell you about Imperfect Foods because that's what Imperfect Foods is here to change. Imperfect Foods is actually the only food delivery service that buys the perfectly nutritious and delicious foods that grocery stores won't sell and delivers them to your doorstep at a discount so you can save money and help with reducing food waste so you can get all of this nutritious, good food delivered to you at a super low price. In fact, it's usually up to 30% less than grocery stores. So all I do is log in and I get to pick exactly what types of produce I want and there's more than produce on there like I just got some vegan cheese as well from Chow Cheese which is one of my favorite brands and then I got like squash and all kinds of things in season that I'm really excited to experiment with some new recipes and they were so cheap so it's just delivered straight to my door I get to choose my items online I got some cashews and some almond butter so I love how they have an array of foods besides fruits and vegetables and how flexible their plan is so I can pick anything I want whenever I choose to get the delivery. They have coffee, they've got quinoa, all kinds of things like slightly scarred almonds, which I haven't tried yet. So start saving time, saving money, and saving waste right now because when you go to imperfectfoods.com slash foodheals, from now until February 16th, you'll get $10 off your next four orders. Really great deal. So that is a total of $40 off. So go to imperfectfoods.com slash foodheals, $10 off your next four for orders. If you want to learn more about Imperfect Foods, you can read about them in the New York Times, Bloomberg, and Forbes, or ask any of their over 200,000 satisfied customers, me now being one of them. So I get all my nutrition at a low cost, and I don't care if the fruit or the veggies that I'm eating are imperfect. They actually make for great Instagram pictures. So up your Instagram game with some imperfectly perfect produce imperfectfoods.com slash food heals and enter food heals at checkout next leslie and i are hanging with rob and devin dion from the open sky fitness podcast and they give us some healthy workout tips for weight loss success roll it roxy for me being healthy didn't have a definite like it was more about aesthetics that for me was always the thing that drove me to either work out or eat a certain way and i'm not going to say eat healthy because when i was when I say eat a certain way, it was not healthy mm -hmm. when I'm, you know, through my 20s. And I didn't focus on being healthy in my 20s. I just focused on working out. That was the thing that I thought would be my body would adjust to whatever food I put in as long as I worked out enough. Right. So I would show up. I, I tell the story with Jeff Meacham, my co-host of the show and one of my best friends from college. And I would show up at the track in Queens and I would have just finished a chili dog and or a slice of pizza or mm -hmm. a hot dog or, or something. I would have just or a gyro in Queens, then I would go for like a 10 mile run with him. 
and I would be burping the entire time. Yeah, I'm like, are you okay? This and he would hard. be like, are you? He would ask me that question. I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I'm just like, I just, I just ate a chili dog. You know, like that kind of thing. <laughs> he's just like, oh my god, man, I can't believe that. And he's just, so that was the, that was how, that was my kind of knowledge around about around being healthy. It was just work out, don't worry about the food. Mm. And then when we flash forward maybe ten years, we're at our honeymoon and we're standing on a waterfall in Hawaii, and she snaps a picture of me from, you know, without me knowing. And just snaps this picture and I just kind of turned around, had no time to suck in my gut and I was totally caught off guard and I had my, like, I just, I just looked the worst that I'd ever looked in my life. I was like 30 pounds heavier than I remember ever being. I, I was disgusted. And that was from that moment. That's when I decided to, I, I, I didn't necessarily completely go 180 degrees, you know, and then get healthy. It was a journey from there. Sure. That was when I was 30. I'll be 41 in a couple of weeks and this has been this has been the journey and it started out with doing a lot of fitness but then also paying attention to how my body feels while I do stuff. So that was so that's where my journey started and to Devin's credit she grew up in a family where they had a lot of access to fresh vegetables. Yeah, we had a huge vegetable garden growing up my mom awesome. and I and, and mm-hmm. like we would get so many zucchinis that they would grow so big that we would actually just cut them in half and make boats out of them and yes. like send them down the creek like that was what was like living in Pennsylvania. Like so many zucchinis they <laughs> yeah. send them down the river. We would send them down the river. Well, it was just like a fun thing and then we'd like drive and see if they came down the river yet like yeah. you know, <laughs> small town. That's Aww. what you do in a small town. You what send you zucchinis do? down the river and you go for a drive to find out if they end up on the other yeah, side just, of the bridge. Just what my mom did in a small town. It was like the hippie in the small town. <laughs> yeah, that's what we did. So she basically, she introduced me to a lot of fresh vegetables. I had, growing up, it was either frozen or canned. That was it for me as a kid and, and mostly microwaved or steamed. And so there was no real desire to eat vegetables. And so when we started dating, she would constantly be introducing me to different kinds of vegetables. And over time, I obviously became very – now we eat vegetables with almost every and he's, meal. he's the better cook now. So, you know, this – so that's kind of where my journey started. And, and it's been over the last 10 years now, especially with the podcast, has been such an eye-opening experience. Yeah. You guys, you know, from all, the, from all the people that you talk to, especially when you're working in, like, in the social media world and you're constantly exposed to people that are doing amazing things. Yeah. There's just so much more information out there than what the average person has access to. Right. I think the great thing about podcasting is it's like the wild west of information. You get to you get to gather that without having to go through you know Fox News or or your local you know Channel Seven that gives you that short little survey that just came out that tells you that one thing is healthy and now all of a sudden you're supposed to change everything about your diet all of a sudden. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's that's what I love about podcasts. You can really and you can latch on. Like people are going to listen to your show. Because they do really believe in a vegan lifestyle. I mean, that's and that's total. That's that's great. Because if it makes them feel good, that's really all that's important. And if it makes them healthy, that's all important. Um. So I I have to talk about fitness. And you guys have um an ebook, Fat Burning Secrets After Thirty Five. Uh. Well, it's not necessarily ebook. I we've done podcast episodes about it. We also have like. In terms of workouts, we have a free ebook giveaway that we do, which is just five different specific workout programs that you can swap out exercises and build your own workouts without even needing a gym. It's all body weight work. And so for the average person who doesn't have access to a gym or doesn't really know how to utilize equipment at a gym. Doesn't have a men-only gym in their garage. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Like a full-on squat rack in their garage. Yeah. Then this is this would be something that's great for them. We do It's it's downloadable. It's openskyfitness.com slash free workouts if you want to download it. And it's, it is really cool the way it's broken down and every single exercise has links to how to do that specific yeah to have how to do that specific exercise oh i love that i'm gonna take a look at that because i travel like crazy and i'm not the biggest fan Mm -hmm. of hotel gyms so i love being able to do workouts on my own in my room without (laughs) and they're they're short because you know if you're looking for like let's say you're looking for weight loss right Mm -hmm. um i mean if you're looking for building strength that that's something different we can talk about weightlifting and things like that but if you're looking at like weight loss 90 percent of it's your diet Yep. And so the physicality is to get your heart rate up, to gain a little bit more muscle, to start to feel good within your body. Create you that know? habit of doing something physical every day. Yeah. And to strengthen your core muscles. You know what I mean? So you don't necessarily need to do a huge workout to be healthy. You know, it can be short and fast. And Yeah. We have people that we're doing, we're doing a challenge right now and we have people that are in, the, uh, in there that do no more than 20 minutes workout every day for six days a week. 
And we have one guy that's lost eight, 30 pounds in eight weeks. Mm-hmm. That's incredible. Wow. You know, and it's just like, and he, obviously that's, that's going to be like the max. I mean, I'm not going to say his weight because I'm sure he wouldn't want me to share it, but he was up there, you know, like his mm-hmm. weight's up there. Mm-hmm. The, the secret was literally getting off of processed food and sugar. Yeah. 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 And that was it. Like, and it's just like the body, and so we know that the workouts aren't doing it. It's, yeah. it's 20 minutes a day. It's not going to have that much of an impact. He is feeling stronger. His energy levels are better. He doesn't feel like he's huffing and puffing when he walk, walks the groceries in. That's cool. But, but how much is that from the processed food being out of his diet too, you know? Mm-hmm. That's probably, yeah, because like, he's not carrying it into the house is yeah. what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> no, but just the energy levels that he's getting yeah. from eating more vegetables. Mm-hmm. Of from course. Whole foods as opposed to crap foods. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly, know? exactly. So there's there's all, every every aspect, that, you know, you guys, you talk about it. I've heard you talk about how there's just all different aspects of being healthy. It's not just fitness. It's not just nutrition. There, There's all different aspects of health that we all need to pay attention to. You don't have to be perfect at anything but you should be trying to do a little bit of everything. Does that make sense? So yeah. that's what so that's what this challenge that we're doing right now is and why working out. We'd I'd love to talk to you about more working out questions if you have that cuz I'm sure that your community is curious about what they can do on a consistent basis. So we do. So I actually pulled the Facebook group today and we did get some questions for you guys. So I would love to go Facebook Live right now okay. and ask some of those questions for you guys. Does sure. that sound good? Yeah, Sounds let's great. do it. All right, our first question is should women be lifting heavier weights while doing less reps how do we lift to stay lean and not bulk up well okay so that's a, that's a really good question and it's something that people do struggle with quite a bit especially women so there's a big misconception that women are going to get huge if they start lifting heavy weights first of all women are just not designed to get that big because you don't have the testosterone that men do have that men have as well as you're not eating as many calories or as much food in order to grow that big Okay. So if you just lift heavy weights, chances – and you're not eating and consuming enough calories in order to rebuild and grow that muscle, and I'll also talk about adaptation in a second, um, you can't technically get that big. Now, will you see some, like, growth in muscle? Sure. But the chances of you getting, like, all of a sudden overnight, like, big traps and guns, you know, like, that's just not going to happen. Yeah, I mean, when you're bodybuilding, especially as a woman, you have to eat so many calories to, yeah. to, to build that muscle mass. Now – if you are bigger to start with and you are then adding muscle to it, you know, you might want to look at your nutrition aspect of it. Yeah. But building of muscle is only going to make your metabolism faster and able to store more calories and glucose in your muscles. So you actually, you're going to lose the weight. You're going to lose the fat. Um, so the bulk up doesn't have to do with the muscle build. That's actually going to lean you out. What it does have to do with is your nutrition. Yeah. So if you're trying, so if you are already bigger, uh, lifting heavy is not going to make you look bigger unless you're also eating a lot of calories yes. to get bigger. Got it. Yeah. So you do have to you do have to adjust. You know, and when I say calories, we don't necessarily count calories. I don't believe in all that crap. Like I just I want to live a healthy lifestyle. But what but what I'm what I'm getting at is that if you're eating more food, you know, consuming an excess of food and not great food and not good quality food, and you're lifting really food, and you're, and you're lifting really heavy, you're going to look like you're getting bigger and kind of fatter. Yeah. That's just the reality of it. Well, yes. And I was going to say, like, from my own experience, you know, I was a dancer. So I wanted always like that ballerina thin body, which was just basically skin and bones. Right. 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 Um, When I started lifting weight, um, I had more of an athletic look, but I was I would say my measurements were probably exactly the same. I just had muscle definition, Mm -hmm. but I wasn't any bigger at all because my diet didn't change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just started lifting weights. And I'll tell you, it made me feel so much better. I used to have a lot of neck and shoulder pain gone just from lifting weights and I thought oh the shoulder like doing shoulder presses was going to be the problem but it wasn't it was really that I was weak in my shoulders and once I got strong then all my pain went away and then there's also something that has to be discussed which is which is a term that maybe a lot of people haven't heard of and it's called adaptation Mm -hmm. our body only adapts to things when we put enough stress on it yes right so if you were going you're burning it out right well not necessarily it's like okay so your body learns from different things that you do. So if you step on a, if you if you go on the treadmill, right? And this is what a lot of uh, marathon runners, this is what they run into, right? They train and they train. Initially, they lose a lot of weight. They might lose like 15, 20 pounds when they're training. And then all of a sudden, there's this plateau and they can't lose any weight no matter how far they run. And it's because what they've done is they've trained their body to run at that at that pace. And their body is basically saying, this person's a lunatic. I need to reserve this fat that I have here because this person's going to continue to do this. So I'm going to hold on to all this and I'm going to get rid of muscle because muscle's heavier than fat in terms of its size. So I'm going to get rid of the muscle. So it starts so, to become cannabolic and eat itself. Yeah. And you and you basically, you just start reserving fat rather than getting rid of, you know, you reserve fat and you're getting rid of muscle. 
what happens is now if you're doing if you're lifting heavier, what you're doing is you're training your body to think I need more muscle mass because if this guy does this again tomorrow, I need to be ready. And so our body adapts to that and it'll continually adapt as time goes by because that's just how our body functions. So if you don't allow for that, so if you don't factor in that adaptation and you just consistently go to gym, the gym and do the same workout all the time, which is what a lot of people do, they show up, they do that workout that they were doing in high school or that they learned four years ago from their personal trainer, their body's done adapting to that. So you need to change it. You need to do something different in order for your body to adjust. And that's consistent change. And you could do it with your nutrition as well. It's kind of like... Yeah, like you were talking... Which I think you were talking about that you're doing intermittent fasting, right? Right. That's what I was going to tell you guys next and, yeah. or, and ask you about your opinion on. Yeah. Um, because that was a game changer for me. And the reason was is because here I am. I'm doing these hardcore Pilates classes that are working me out. I'm burning it out. They are hard, you guys. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking... I know that some people think Pilates is easy peasy, but I'm taking the... Depends ho- who the teacher is. Exactly. Yeah. I'm taking the hardest ones in Hollywood. And then I'm running. <laughs> and I'm like, but nothing is changing. And I'm like vegan and I'm eating really well so I'm like okay what is the problem and for me and it may not be for everyone but for me what really changed I literally lost 10 pounds within a month was I had to eat less in a smaller amount of time okay Mm. so that was when I discovered intermittent fasting because I had this myth like in my mind because it was told to me by a nutritionist by a holistic doctor who had looked at my levels and all of that that I needed to eat every few hours because I had low Mm. blood sugar. So I took that to heart and I was eating all the time. I was tired. I had fatigue. I was sleeping longer because my body was not actually taking that well. Even though I was eating very small amounts, healthy Mm -hmm. foods, whatever, my body did not want to eat all the time. My body needs more time to digest than some other people's bodies. That's what I've discovered. Therefore, the longer I fast, the longer I take between meals, the better I feel. So if I eat between a smaller amount of time and then fast for a longer amount of time, time I feel fantastic and I drop weight and I keep my exercise up. Then I can actually see definition. Yeah. I'm like wondering where the definition was. My girlfriend's like, oh my God, your legs are so skinny. And I'm like, I have done nothing. I'm doing the same exercise. You're just fasting. Well, what happens is it's a hormonal response, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Because when you're in, insul- when you have insulin pumping through your system all the time, it stops the adrenaline that actually takes the fat from your body and uses that as energy. Yeah. Right. So you need those breaks between digestion in order to allow your body to burn fat. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just on this constant insulin. And so run. I wonder, is it okay? I mean, I know doctors are telling people eat all the time. And Doctors are telling people a lot of things about yeah, nutrition, and they're they way off. Right, right, yeah. right, right. They, yeah. they actually have to take one nutrition class to become a doctor. One. And actually, I have a people that don't even have to take any. Yeah, you don't have to take any, or you're not graded on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like a pass fail mm-hmm. or something like that. Yeah, it's yeah, a lot like of yeah, just don't show up. Yeah, yeah. And exactly. I, and unfortunately, like I feel like most of America is taking their nutrition advice from their doctors. I know, like his parents and his dad's had two. A triple bypass, three heart attacks. Two. I don't know. My dad's basically somehow my my dad's heart's still beating, and uh, and he's had multiple strokes, and you know, and and, they've, and, and his mom has followed the diet program that their doctor gave them, which is not obviously helped. Yeah, at which all. is just whole wheat, and you know, like eat just basically like whole wheat diet, you know, kind of thing. It's yeah, but, pro- lots lots of processed food. And yeah, lo- lots and low of fat. Food. Right. Well, yeah. I think this is the most food. important thing in what we were just talking about a little bit is that w- when I talk to people, it's about listening to your body because your body is giving you signals constantly of what it likes and what it doesn't like and what it needs and what it doesn't need. And it's about tuning in and listening to that and creating the diet that works for you because I don't believe in an umbrella diet that's good for yeah. everyone in this mm-hmm. world. I'm pretty sure that's the, the consensus, consensus at yep. this table as well. Yeah. yeah. And so it's so important to listen to your body and figure out what it's saying to you. Well, yeah. I think that even if you just look around the world from all the different nations that have different diets for, you know, all the different cultures. I mean, you have the Inuits in Alaska that ate basically whale fat. They were on like a ketogenic diet, like a 75, 80% fat diet. And they had no heart disease, no diabetes. Yeah. Whereas people in Africa are eating some vegetables, some grains and some insects, you know what I mean? So, and they were completely healthy. And then you have people like in, you know, small islands off the coast of Ireland that are eating like cod heads for breakfast. And they have great health. So it really yeah. just depends on... Totally depends. I highly recommend The Blue Zone. Yeah, I was just thinking um, By National it. Geographic, if you've read into that a lot. Um, a friend Dan Butner is doing all of the investigative reporting on it. And it's fascinating. He's studying The Blue Zones where the people are living to over 100 years old. And like, Very why? Cool. And so it's, it's... 
it's a whole look at the entire community. Did and they find things that are in common with all of them? Yes. They did. Yes. A lot. And my favorite one is wine at five. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was a clip from episode 199 of Food Heals, so feel free to go back if you want to listen to the full episode, 199, and check out everything Rob and Devin are up to at openskyfitness.com. And while you're listening to this show, don't forget, Food Heals Nation, that I am here to help you on your wellness and weight loss journey to end the emotional eating, to drop the body shame, and to lose the weight for good. So if you're listening to these episodes and these things are resonating and you want to take the next step, check out my free course, Five Steps to Food Freedom. That's at freeweightlosscourse.com. And I'm going to break down for you all of the things that I do on a regular basis that I practice to truly get me into a state of having food freedom from not body shaming myself anymore, from not overeating, from not eating when I'm not hungry, for not emotionally eating. These are the things that have truly helped me. And then if you need to go next level, if you're like, I need to deep dive into this stuff, don't worry, I've got your back. I have a three week course for you. That's at dropthefoodshame.com. And that's for you if you felt like a yo-yo dieter most of your life. If you feel shame when you look in the mirror, which look, I understand. I've absolutely been there. If you've found yourself using food as a reward, maybe after work or after a hard day, um, if you're using food as something to avoid your feelings, which let's face it, most people are doing that on a regular basis, whether they're aware of it or not. And so this is really about cultivating awareness of your eating habits so you can be empowered to change them. Um, If you felt like you have tried everything to lose the weight, tried everything to get well, this course is for you because we uh, we address the not only the physical um, aspect of healing and health, but also the emotional and spiritual aspect of healing and weight loss. And if you have ever felt shame around your body, shame around the food you're eating, if you are, you know, negative patterns in your head and you're telling yourself horrible things about yourself every day, We're going to stop that. We're going to stop that right now in the three weeks. I'm going to give you the tools to put into your healing toolbox to drop the body shame for good and to stop that negative self-talk. Because when you stop that talk and you truly cultivate self-love for who you are exactly in this moment right now, that's when things change. Things don't change when you go, when you beat yourself up. Things change when you go, I am happy right now. Then the body you want becomes yours and the things you want become yours. So I've got practices for that. I've got tools for that. I'm going to teach you exactly how to do that. So if you are fed up with feeding your feelings with food and experiencing the guilt and the shame and the self-judgment that comes along with it, go to dropthefoodshame.com, enroll in food freedom. I've got your back. Email me if you have any questions, info at foodhealsnation.com. Next up, Susie and I are talking to Ella Majors. Ella is a frequent guest on the show, and she even attended our most recent Italy retreat. Ella's here to drop some truth bombs about how to get fit and jumpstart your fat-burning efforts. Roll it, Roxy. Well, let's talk about why, why does our fat go there? Well, you know, it's funny because everybody has their, like, you know, spots, their trouble right. spots. Right. And for some people, for a lot of people, that is around the midsection. And so we wear like those shirts that pregnant women wear to like cover them up. And we, we go through all sorts of things. But sometimes also people, you know, have um, especially women around the hips and around the, the thighs. So everybody's kind of got a different area that they're most concerned about. It just so happens that the midsection is a very popular one. That's, I would that, say for me, when my weight fluctuates, that's the first that's the first thing to go. It's the stomach That's- and the boobs for me. <laughs> yeah? I have, like, different bra sizes for my weight fluctuations. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, it's like it's like when you gain weight, you gain it, like, where you don't want it. And then when you lose it, you're like, oh, there goes my boobs I and know. my butt. And you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't get to choose like that. So, yeah, it's so funny. So how do we turn our bodies into fat belly burning machines? So what do you guys think about when, when I would say, okay, let's go get some abs? What would you think would be like the, your first reaction of what, what do I need to go do? Crunches, sit-ups, yeah. Right. So that's like the most common answer. People, oh, I got to go do a million crunches. So there's a few problems with that. So we need to look at that, that we don't, we need to like expand our minds about what the tummy, like a flat tummy means. Okay. And unfortunately, because crunches are pretty easy to do, you can do all the crunches in the world. You can do all the ab exercises in the world. 
But think about it. If you have this, a layer of fat on top of those muscles, you're not going to have flat abs. You know, right? so I know that. I have really good abs. They're I do just, too. They're just they're under, under the fat. <laughs> yeah, they're under a nice little layer. They're hiding. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so we have to learn to like get rid of what's on top. So yes, we need a strong core. So you know, one one thing, if you're looking at kind of the rock solid things to do, absolutely, you know, ab exercises are one. And like, if you kind of look at more of a core work, so that's working really your core is from your shoulders all the way down um, under your hips. Mm -hmm. That's your core. And in the problem with like doing just ab exercises and just doing a million crunches every day trying to get those abs. Number one, again, like if you don't have what's on the, the fat on top, if that's not gone, you're never going to see them. Number two, you're going to develop imbalances in the body. Mm. So if you're working abs, 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 think about your abs getting tighter, tighter, tighter. What's getting looser, looser? Your back. Your back. Exactly. So how many people out there a plus have for me. back I was, problems? I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, right? I know a bit of physiology. I stick for massage therapy. I know that, you know, every, every muscle, mu- muscles have pairs mm-hmm. and exactly. they always work synergistically. If one does one, one action, there's always another that does the opposite. Mm-hmm. And if one, and if one of those is too, t- so for the, the abs, the core, it's the opposite is the back, the back, ex- the back extends the abs. Wait, hold on. The abs, I have to think about this. The abs contract our spine and, the, and our back extends the spine. Right, mm-hmm. Ella? Right, exactly, exactly. So if we're creating that imbalance, that's when the lower back pain comes. That's when we start to like have that hunch, you know, the hunchback mm-hmm. is because we a lot of times tighten the front side of our body because that's what we're concerned about. That's what we look down and see. We just both sat up straight when you said hunchback. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And you know, then we're sitting over desks all day and and our back's getting looser, and our, our front side's getting tighter, and then we develop bad posture, we develop awful habits, and it's really not going to do any good in the long run. So it's important to, number one, when we are looking at exercises, yes, ab exercises are important, um, but also to make sure that you're balancing out your back, because who cares if you have nice abs if you've got a big hunchback, right? Sure. I've so. never heard of that being in. That's, <laughs> that's never not, been a... Yeah, they've had the bustle for the... Ever get in. They've had the bustle for the big butt. They've had corsets. I've never heard of the, the, the hunchback. The hunchback. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have had shoulder pads. That's true. <laughs> that's true. Um, yeah, so that's just one thing to take into consideration. So sure, yes, ab exercises are great, and there's a million of them out there, and you can do lots of amazing abs exercises where you're like bending back over, um, getting full extension, full range of motion by using like a BOSU ball or, or, you know, the big exercise ball so you get full extension. So, yes, those exercises are great, but those are easy. You can look those up and you can just start doing them. Those, that's the easy part. The hard part is getting the diet right. Unfortunately, that's what gonna, it's going to come down to in the end. So, number one, getting rid of really – actually, I like, to, I like to talk about what you do fill your plate with as opposed to what you take away from your plate. Mm-hmm. And what we do want to fill our plates with is the most nutrient-dense – like if you say, what should I be eating on a daily basis? How many nutrient-dense whole plant foods can you get on your plate in one day? Mm-hmm. When you're getting all those nutrients in your body, that's when your body can kind of let go of the extra body fat. And if you're not getting those nutrients, that's not going to happen. So the diet part is so huge in cutting empty calories from your diet. I always tell people you can't outrun your fork. Mm. Um, so, so what does that mean? It means that no matter how hard you can be working out, out you know, hours a day and running your body down and overtraining and doing all these things that are going to ultimately break your body down. But yes, burning a ton of calories. But then you sit down and eat one junk meal and you've got like 1,200 calories. Do you know how long it takes like doing a cardio workout to burn off 1,200 calories and how much work that is? I don't want to know. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I've, I've tried out Orange Theory Fitness, um, which is a, like uh-huh. a national and now international chain. I saw them yeah. in Canada. And they track. They put a nice heart monitor on you. And it's an intense a circuit training workout. It's great. And I loved it. You know, I burned a lot of calories. I was really pushing myself. And it was, you know, like 500 and that's a lot for an hour, I think. And it was taxing. It was a taxing right. workout. So yes, if you have a, one meal of twelve hundred, it's a lot. Yeah, I mean, you guys, you do, you do burpees ever? Like yep. everybody yes. loves burpees, right? Yes. Yeah. So so think about how many burpees it would take if we're looking at just the calorie aspect to burn off um, three Oreo cookies, which are vegan. Three little Oreo cookies. Like how many burpees about would you have to do to burn off those calories? I'm gonna say ninety. Um, I'm going to say 120. Yeah, about uh, over 100. We're so three close. Cookies. So if we, 
yeah, if we if we start to look at that and be like, okay, are these three Oreo cookies? Because, and I'm not looking at calories of like when we're talking about calorie quality, then we don't have to worry about it so much. But when you're looking at empty calories that are just going in, they're doing nothing good for you, then those are empty calories that do need to get burned off or they turn into fat. So yeah, if you think about eating three little cookies, which can take five minutes and not, of course, fill you up or anything, and then you have to go do 120 burpees, like, you know, then you start to think, is that really, is that really worth it? And how fast those can add up, those, those empty calories can add up and start to put on the fat. And then, and then to take it off, you know, you do need that calorie deficit. But again, I always stress quality. If you focus on the quality of the food you're putting in your mouth, as opposed to, oh, I have to take away potato chips. Like you're going to fill your plate and you're going to be full and satisfied. And then you can, yeah, you can work in your treats. I like to go have a beer. Like, I just had a, a cocktail at a vegan bistro opening. Mm-hmm. Like, it's okay to go and do those things, but in a big balanced sense. And I always tell my clients, it's about finding the right balance for you. What are you willing to do? How strict are you willing to be? And, and not to give up your social life and to still have a life and still have fun and enjoy being social with your friends and your family and holidays. You, d- you don't need to give all that up in order to have apps. I agree. And, and it's, yeah, if you get that balance, you got to find that balanced lifestyle that works for you. And everybody's body works a little different. Some people are naturally burn fat easier than other people. So, you know, we're all born with slightly different body types. And for some people also like eating um, a high carb diet, that works really well for them. For me, that doesn't work for me. And I've experimented a lot over the last, I've been vegan for 22 years mm-hmm. and into fitness since I was five years old. So I've been in the fitness industry experimenting with my diet and with my clients' diets to see that not everybody, like when people are like, how many grams of protein do I need? How many grams of carbs do I need to lean out? It's unfortunately, it'd be easy to say like, oh, you need exactly this many. And number one, that's not sustainable. Who wants to count the number of grams of protein you're eating every day for the rest of your life in order to have a nice body? Nobody. So it's really about really discovering in yourself what foods work for you. And then the other tip I'm going to give you, which is huge and made a huge difference for me and and the lives of a lot of my clients, is the idea of chewing your food to a paste before you swallow. Mm. Oh, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Because (laughs) I went went on this cruise. um, I did a book signing on the holistic holiday at sea cruise. This was like two years ago. Fun. And yeah, it was, it was a blast. And we had all the major speakers on there. We had Michael Greger, Dr. Michael Greger, who I'm just in love with, Dr. Campbell. They were all there speaking. And mm-hmm. I forgot who it was that just made this point about how important it is to chew your food to a pace before you swallow it. And this was two years ago for me. And I, that just, for some reason, that's what I took away from that whole cruise. And it changed my life. And what does to like, a pace mean? That's a lot I mean, of like, chews. Like, I know. I, that's a lot of chews. I it's mean, a lot of chews. It's, it's approximately 30. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot. And if you start to notice, like you just start to be aware, and, and you probably will after we have this conversation because it seems so silly, but it's, it's so different when you actually start to do it. And the amount of time it all of a sudden takes you to eat a meal like doubles or triples. How did you come up and with 30? Well, I, that's what they said. That's what she said. I, I, I know, I've, I've known about this. I've heard of this. Like the mm-hmm. more the, like you have, like, first of all, you, you, your saliva has enzymes that yes. are almost, pre- that are yes. pre-digesting yeah. so that your, exactly. in, your stomach doesn't have to do all the work. And we, we don't do that in the United States. Mm-hmm. We chew, I've seen my husband do it. Chew, chew, swallow. Yeah. Yep. And it's take the next bite as right, soon as possible. Right, right. As soon as you put it in your mouth, your eyes are on your next bite. Right, which is kind of culturally how we are anyway. It's to the next thing, to the next well, thing. Well, it's because we have to go get on that conference call or go do that next errand or whatever it is because we're these quick moving, you right. know, fast paced society people. Right. But in if general. you chew slowly and you taste the food and you enjoy it, you eat, you wind up eating less. You, you, you also, your body will tell you it's satiated, it's full sooner. Because if you're chewing, if you chew, chew, swallow, you're gonna, you can, I did this the other night. Oh my God. I did this the other night. <laughs> I had we some, all do it all the time. I had some delicious Korean food and I was, I was hungry and I was eating too fast and then I had a tummy ache. Mm-hmm. So yeah, sorry, go on. So we're talking about chewing to a paste. <laughs> no, you guys, you guys got it. You're exactly you're like, you're hitting home exactly what I'm talking about. It's, it's like, we don't do that and we don't even notice we're not doing it. And then yes, we overstuff ourselves because by the time we realize we're full, 
it's 20 minutes later, like the food hasn't even gotten to the bottom of our stomachs yet. No. So 20 minutes later, we're like stuffed. I mean, we talk about being stuffed in this country so much and it's no, nobody likes to be stuffed. It's not a really good feeling to no. have, but it's like, we don't have those tools to stop when we're supposed to stop. And I'm telling you, if you focus on chewing your food, number one, you appreciate the food, mm -hmm. you taste the food. All of a sudden you're eating mindfully, which is, that sounds a very generic thing to say, but if you say, okay, but I'm just going to focus on chewing my food. That's going to turn you into a mindful eater. Oh, I was just going to say, and also not doing anything else while you're eating, mm -hmm. yeah. not watching TV, reading, being on your phone, being on Facebook. If you're with friends or family, mm -hmm. be with them. If you're alone, yes. just be mindful, as you're saying, like, like taking in the food, and that's what you're doing. That's actually, don't do it while you're driving. Don't do it while you're working. <laughs> like, take the time to sit with your food and be mindful with it. And Susie, I think you actually taught me this on one of our podcast episodes. I forget which one, but it was about, there was a book about how French women don't get fat. Yes. And it was one of the That's reasons what it's called. was because they <laughs> ate and they took two hours to eat meals in the mm -hmm. middle of the day with friends, families, coworkers, yep. what have you. And so that's mindful eating, even if you're in a group setting, because you're appreciating the food. They're appreciating each other. It's actually more healthy to eat with friends mm -hmm. and family. Mm -hmm. That's the way we're meant to be. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, Community. Yeah. We're not meant to be so solitary. I read a, a, another book recently that reinforced this. It was called Sex Before Dawn. Mm -hmm. And it goes all over that the place. good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do it. But it, it was talking about how, you know, we're not meant to be solitary. We're not, we, were, we were raised in, in groups and communities and clans. And that's how we evolved. And now we're, we've evolved away from that. But it is very important to eat with people if you can. And in the blue zones where people live to be over 100 years old, one of the common denominators is community. They never eat alone. Yeah. First of all, mm -hmm. cooking and preparing food is a is everybody's involved, mm -hmm. you know, and then and it's a celebratory thing. Yeah. And now we live these a lot of people live these solitary lifestyles where they're mm -hmm. eating alone or they're eating at their desks mm -hmm. in the middle of the day in the or middle in their of work. car. I've eaten in the car. I've eaten in the car. Okay. Um, so that's <laughs> no, a we're all guilty of it. And I was just, I was just telling you guys, I was in Europe um, for almost a month mm -hmm. just recently. And, and wow, I mean, most, the majority of people don't even own TVs. They don't think about going home after work to sit down and watch TV and, and eat TV dinners. Wow. It's like, it's a whole different culture. And I think, you know, a big reason why we're such an obese nation is that we do have this habit of, oh, work's done. Oh, good. I get to go home and like veg. You know, yep. veg on the couch and, and watch TV and be solitary and just mindlessly eat to get rid of the days, you know, whatever's on my mind for the day. And and that culture, if we can get out of that routine, out of that habit, it is just a routine and a habit that we have that is possible to get out of. And yeah. I totally agree. And this is a whole other episode, but that's why I ask anyone to question if that is what you look forward to at the end of your day is getting home and eating and watching TV and that's, look, once in a while, fine, whatever. But if that's a sure. regular day-to-day -day thing, then look at your life and go, what do I need to change? That's why Susie, yeah. Roxy, I, Ella, probably you two are entrepreneurs because we're doing what we love. And so we don't need to come home and go, oh my God, I have to recover from my yeah. horrible day, from my horrible boss, whatever. Not that that doesn't happen to us too, please. No, we have other problems. Well, we have other problems. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that day in and day out, I'm looking forward to what I'm having to dinner for dinner and watching TV at night, yeah. you yeah. know? You know, I feel like people are going to come to this episode and be like, oh, what's she going to tell me in five minutes? I'm going to know what to do and I'm tomorrow I'll go do it. But, you know, unfortunately, it is a lifestyle. Abs are a lifestyle. Unless you're going to deprive yourself and be like a bodybuilder diet and eat chicken and broccoli every day for the rest of your life. Like to make it into a lifestyle, it's like a, a vegan abs lifestyle, but you find the balance that's right for you. So it, it, it's the exercise, but it, even more importantly, it's the diet and staying hydrated is just one more like these little things, chewing your food and drinking a ton of water, flushing out your system every day, waiting 12 hours in between dinner and breakfast mm -hmm. um, to have a full 12 hours to let your body really fully digest all the food that's in your system, push it through and kind of start fresh in the morning um, when it comes to like some very you know, simple, solid things to do, but that you need to be mindful about doing. Um, I would say it's the, the staying hydrated the chewing your food to a paste, waiting 12 hours between dinner and breakfast, and then getting in your workouts, always focusing on your core. So even when you're doing cardio workouts, you're really focusing on sucking your belly button in towards your spine and you're really 
holding everything in really tight. So, so everything's an ab workout if you, if you hold your core in tight while you're doing that workout. And that all of my workout teachers stress that so hardcore. So yeah. if you have a good class that you take, then they're going to guide you how to, th- how to do that. When I'm on my own, I don't do it as well because I don't have someone telling me. I personally need the teacher telling me like, you know, how to breathe and how to do exactly what you were talking about earlier, how to do the opposite of exercise of everything I'm doing to balance out the back and the abs and all of that kind of, mm-hmm. kind of thing. So I take these Pilates and yoga classes, primarily Pilates reformer, and they teach us how to do those things. But if I didn't have that yeah. teaching, I wouldn't know. I would have no idea I'd be doing it all wrong. I'm sure I was doing it all wrong before my, the first half of my life, you know? Yeah, no, I'm a big class proponent. You find good classes, good teachers, and, you know, that's what they're there for. That's what we're here for is to remind you of those things that you would not, you would not otherwise know. Food Heals Nation, did you know that Americans spend an average of 90% of their time indoors and take about 20,000 breaths per day? According to the EPA, indoor air is two to five times more polluted than outdoor air, and in some cases, this is scary, up to 100 times more polluted. The data shows that air pollution is responsible for nearly 7 million premature deaths globally. That's why it's so important to filter the air in our homes. You remember my story after discovering toxic mold in my home almost a year ago, I realized the importance of having multiple high quality air filters in my home to protect myself, to protect the air that I'm breathing and the air that my beagle Lily is breathing. Think about every everyone in your household, your family members, your roommates, your kids, your cats, your dogs, your pets, right? We have to be so conscious of the air that we're breathing inside, but that's why I'm obsessed with Air Doctor. You can visit airdoctorpro.com, use the code FOODHEALS, and you can get up to 39% off an air purifier. Air Doctor filters out 99.99% of dangerous contaminants and allergens like pollen and pet dander and dust mites and mold and even bacteria and viruses. So your lungs don't have to. It's so easy to set up. It's quiet and I can rest easy knowing I'm breathing cleaner air every day when I'm working from home. If you work from home like me, you've got to filter your air. So head on over to airdoctorpro.com, use the promo code FOODHEALS, and depending on the model you pick, you'll receive up to 39% off or up to $300 off. This is exclusive to Food Heals Nation listeners. You'll also receive a free three-year warranty on any unit, which is an additional $84 value. Check it out by going to A-I-R-D-O-C-T-O-R-P-R-O.com, airdoctorpro.com, and use promo code FOODHEALS. Food Heals Nation, if you're like me, you know that drinking enough water is imperative for our hydration and our detox. And I personally try to drink half my body weight in ounces of water per day. But have you thought about the quality of water that you are drinking? So according to the Environmental Working Group, virtually every home in the U.S. has harmful contaminants in its tap water. So ditch the tap water, ditch the cheap water filters, and check out my favorite water purifier company, AquaTrue. You can visit AquaTrue.com, use the coupon code FOODHEALS for 20% off any AquaTrue purifier. AquaTrue purifiers use a four-stage reverse osmosis purification process, and their countertop purifiers work with no insulation, no plumbing. I set it up myself, don't worry, it's easy. It removes 15 times more contaminants than ordinary pitcher filters and are specifically designed to combat chemicals like PFAs in our water supply. The filters are affordable and long lasting, no changing filters every two to three months. AquaTrue filters last from six months up to two years. AquaTrue comes with a 30 day money back guarantee and even makes a great gift. Today, my listeners will receive 20% off any AquaTrue purifier. Just go to AquaTrue.com, that's A Q U A T R U.com, and enter the code FOODHEALS at checkout. That's 20% off any AquaTrue water purifier when you go to AquaTrue.com and use code FOODHEALS. 
To hear the full interview with Ella, go back to episode 269 of Food Heals. All right, next up, we are talking to Tim Kaufman, who went from being 400 pounds. He was unable to walk. He was suffering with a multitude of chronic conditions and illnesses, and he was addicted to prescription painkillers. Went from that to climbing mountains and running marathons, all through juicing and changing his diet and his mindset. He shares his incredible journey with us in this next clip. I know it's going to inspire you, Food Heals Nation. Roll it, Roxy. Can you kind of start at the beginning and tell us, you know, what health conditions you were struggling with? Basically, I had uh, like a normal, you know, teenage years and I kind of grew up on a farm. So I did a lot of manual labor. Um, As I got older, like into my late teens, um, I was always like twisting my ankles and stuff. So we thought I was just like clumsy or accident prone or whatever. Mm -hmm. What we found out is as time went on and I got into my early 20s, I got into like factory work and, you know, working a lot over my head and stuff. And my joints were getting so loose that actually when I would sneeze, my shoulder would pop right on me. It would dislocate. Oh, my God. You know, the older I got, the more injuries I had, you know, the more loose my joints became. And I was like everything like kind of. If I would pull on a wrench, my wrist would actually like separate off my arm. So I started going to the doctor and really we were focused on my shoulder because I could hardly work anymore. They went in there to fix it. They did something called an arthroplasty. Mm -hmm. And basically they cut behind my shoulder and then they pull up all the tendons and ligaments out. And then they they fold them on top of each other and then stitch them back up to kind of tighten You know, if you can imagine strings, they kind of fold them over each other and then tie them together to tighten everything up. Yeah. You know, it was a it was a pretty intense surgery. And, you know, I was, you know, in a sling for a while. The doctor kind of knew when he got in there, he said something wasn't right because everything was like too stretchy. Um, Actually, I'm pretty fortunate because a lot of people have it um, where they have organ damage and blood vessels. And really, the only thing I have is the hypermobile. So it's called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. There's a bunch of different Mm -hmm. types and a bunch of different, you know, levels of it. But when I went for physical therapy, um, no one would work on me because I would just like start to move my arm and my shoulder would pop right out of my back again, like even after surgery. And they were telling me how tight it was going to be and it'd be hard to move, but it really wasn't. So at the same time, my sister in Connecticut was going through some of the she, she had some of the same symptoms um, and they have Yale up there. So she went to get some genetic testing done. And that's when, you know, we found out we had this Ehlers-Danlos thing. So, you know, I was in my early 20s. And actually, when I went for the diagnosis, the doctor got out disability papers. And I got married super young to my high school sweetheart. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're in our early 20s. We just bought a house. I had a really good job in the UAW. And here this guy's giving me disability papers. I'm like, yeah, that's not happening. Yeah. So the doctor's thing was you have to get out of the factory. You can't do manual labor because it's just going to get worse and worse. Mm. Um, So I went back to school to become a teacher, which took forever because I was actually a high school dropout. And so that's what I do now. I'm a teacher. But the, the goal was to not use my body for leverage, get a more sedentary job. And then at the same time in my early 20s, after the surgery, I mean, I was in a lot of pain. So I started getting, you know, Lord tabs and codeine and, and started with stuff like that. And then obviously, you know, you build up a tolerance. So every time I went back to the doctor, they seemed to up them and, you know, I would ask for it. Mm-hmm. And the more tolerance I built, the heavier the dosage. And yeah. that just became a part of life. And then the inflammation, because every time it hurt something, it, you know, the joint would get inflamed and And then I got into, you know, a job where I wasn't moving around as much and I started eating worse. You know, then we had kids and things got really busy. So, you know, the more busy we got, the less I did, then the weight started coming on. And then what happened is as I'm building up this tolerance for like normal, I call them normal Mm -hmm. painkillers. But I would go into the doctor and sometimes my blood pressure was like 255 over 115. Oh, my God. And I was actually on three different medicines for that. It was out of control, even on the max dose of like calcium channel blockers, beta blockers. And there was one out of the one I forgot. But again, I I kept telling them while I'm in pain. So then I ended up on fentanyl and fentanyl is stronger than morphine. Mm. 
And it was actually instead of a pill, it was a patch. So basically I had a constant supply of fentanyl in my body. Wow. So there's no ups and downs and no withdrawals. You just, it's there. Mm -hmm. But same deal, build up tolerance and then the dosage keeps getting up. So they're all unsustainable solutions. Absolutely. And, and I think that's like, that's a given. I look back now and sometimes I wonder if I would have asked the question when, when he would get out medicine, I would love to go back and say, well, how long am I on this for? Yeah. I just would love to see his face. Um, <laughs> Cause I don't think they don't think about that. You know what? How long are you on blood pressure medicine for? That's it. You Forever. Got it for the rest of your life, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I never thought about that. So I, I just did what I was supposed to do. And so my cholesterol, I'm kind of fast forwarding a little bit, but my cholesterol danced always 300. I was always hoping it was a little bit under 300. And now like 117, I would love to see a pill that can do that. Right. There isn't a pill. <laughs> no. And what happened along with the weight, I mean, I kept getting bigger and bigger, but at the same time, all that extra weight on my joints was just compounding the problem. And what was your diet like at this time? Honestly, it's kind of embarrassing, but uh, <laughs> that's okay. That's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> so we would eat. I live in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. So Buffalo wings are like the thing, you know, mm -hmm. and so we would get pizza and wings special most of the time about four nights a week. Um, and the fast food was really I mean, I was straight up addicted to it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have told you that at the time. I would leave for work and I would get two sausage egg and cheese biscuits with hash browns and then a giant Diet Coke like every single morning. Mm, and for lunch, I would go to a taco place and they have these half pound tacos that are just there's grease like yellow. It used to actually stain my forearms. Oh, my grease. God. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. And then I would get like the jalapeno poppers deep fried. I'd get a couple orders of them. And then on the way home, I would stop at Burger King and get like two double cheeseburgers to get home to go eat pizza and wings. And that wasn't like a once in a while thing. That was like every single day. Even on the weekends, I would catch myself sneaking out in the morning to go get breakfast at wow. a fast food place. Yeah. And the sad thing is, is that your story isn't unique. You know, thousands of people across America do that as their typical standard American diet because it's cheap, it's convenient, it's easy, and tastes it good. tastes good. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, the heavier I got, the food just got worse and worse. And then, obviously, over 15 years of controlled substances, I was, I was pretty addicted. I guess I didn't really realize how addicted I was. But I was starting to do some stuff that I shouldn't have done, like trying to, you know, get scripts early and, you know, quote unquote, losing them and mm -hmm. shopping for doctors Doctor and stuff. shopping, yep. Friends that had wisdom teeth pulled. And, you know, some of the stuff I'm, I'm pretty embarrassed about, but it still wasn't enough. And what, you know, looking back, I don't think uh, my problem was really the physical pain as much as I was just wanting to escape. Mm. You know, I've told I've told people before it's like there were nights I went to bed that I didn't know if I'd wake up in the morning. I don't know if I really cared. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't say I was suicidal. I have a wife that loves me. I have two young kids at the time. Um, I had a really good job. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, I was going to be suicidal, but I knew like I was really sick and I don't really think I cared if I woke up, you know, in the morning. It was it was tough physically, but it was, you know, tougher emotionally. Absolutely. Um, I don't really talk about this too much, but then I, I started getting into the alcohol and stuff. And that just that got way out of control, mm. um, like super out of control. A lot. There were a lot of nights where I would get up to go to the bathroom and my kidneys were just like shut down. I couldn't I couldn't get I had to go so bad and nothing would come out. Oh, God. So, yeah, I was I was in rough shape. And was all the emotional uh, distress caused because of the physical or was there something deeper going on? Was there some unresolved issues that you needed to deal with in order to heal? I think it's all kind of intertwined. Um, um, like I say, I got, I got married super young and is like my best friend. She's always, I mean, since we were 14 years old, she's been my best and so we had my son, like we were 21 years old. So we had, you know, a rough go like financially and, you know, things that young kids you would expect. Um, but I was always a big, tough working guy. You know, the stuff that would bother me more than anything is like 
she's got two kids she's taking care of and she's outside mowing the lawn and I'm sitting in a chair with ice around my knees watching TV. Mm-hmm. And it was hard, you know, it, that that aspect of it was harder than any of the physical stuff, you know, and and, she, you know, she genuinely cared. And I think, you know, some of my stuff, I had legit excuse to be on the couch. Um, but it's still, I mean, a, as a guy, I mean, that, that broke my heart. Yeah, and your pride being a provider and caring for your your wife and your family. And, and same with the kids. I mean, they'd go to take a walk. And I would be sitting on the couch while she would, you know, load up two strollers and try to juggle kids to take them to the park. And I just I couldn't go. Well, this is all really, really interesting knowing now because I know what you look like now. Um, So you were at this point where you didn't care if you woke up in the morning and you didn't necessarily want to. How did you transform this? Like I sat down and I'm like, I'm done. I'm finished. Um, But you know, after watching two of your favorite people in the whole world, like fight for their life. And I question myself, I'm like, am I am I really fighting? I set some goals. And I said, I gotta I have to lose weight. A little side thing here. Um, My entire life was me. I mean, I sausage bacon, you know, all like all that stuff. Did you ever eat fruits or vegetables? as few as possible, you know, <laughs> so that would take up space for bacon, you know, right. literally, that's how I thought. And right. is that how you're you were raised in terms of food? Um, yeah, you know, my dad grew up on a farm, and, and he was a hunter as well. And, and that's just how we were brought up. And so what made you make the change to the plant based lifestyle? So what I did, I did what every other person in America, I think does, you know, you go on a diet. So what I did, along with that whole meat processing thing, we started cutting the red meats out. I started logging my food, which was really weird. I started keeping a journal, which was even more weird because mm-hmm. I'm just not a journal kind of guy. So I started writing stuff down, writing what I was eating, and I lost weight. Like at 400, any changes you make, you're going to see results. Like, right. pretty, um, But I still felt like crap. So as time went on, I was getting lighter. So I was feeling better just from the weight being off me. And I And then one day I'm sitting on the couch and I'm flipping through Netflix and I saw Fat, Sick and Nearly Dead come up. Mm -hmm. One of our favorites. Yeah, I'll watch that. So, well, you know the story. Joe Cross comes to the U.S. You know, he does a 60-day fast. He loses like 60 pounds, gets rid of a bunch of diseases that he had and sicknesses. Um, Super inspiring. And I I was, you know, Phil the truck driver. Super. Yeah, Phil is like... Joe's story is great, but Phil's is like, all right, anyone can do this now. You know, if Phil, the truck driver, can do it, anyone can do it. Yeah, and I really, like, I really related with a lot of what he said. So before the credits rolled, I ordered a juicer from Amazon. It just happened that January 1st was coming around the corner, and I got this juicer. I had no clue what I was doing. I went into this juice fast on the first. I go to the the grocery store and I get like a clump of, you know, because I wanted to do the mean green thing. And I bring all this stuff back, which I thought was a lot of stuff. I put it in the juicer and there's like a quarter cup of juice. And I'm like, (laughs) yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) it takes a lot of fruits and veggies to make that juice. (laughs) If anything, what that movie did is it started showing me how to shop. And we had never shopped. If we shopped, it was like to pick up pizza rolls. So, you know, we started shopping and I started hanging out in the produce and it was cool because I would get like excited. I'm like, oh, kale's on sale. Get two bunches, you know. (laughs) And so it was a little rocky start. Day three, I wanted to die. And day four, I wanted to die even more. I bet. After kind of the fifth day, I kind of settled into it. I'm like, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. The first thing I noticed, like by the end of the first week. I slept through the night and Mm. that sounds so stupid, but like I hadn't slept through a night in years, like years and years and years. And I didn't know what that felt like anymore. You know? Yeah. You wouldn't think it makes such a big difference if you have to get up and use the bathroom or get up and get water, but it does. Or if you're just uncomfortable yeah. and you cannot tossing stay and turning, yeah. Well, I would like I would stop breathing, and Heather would have to shake me. You know, she'd think I was dying, and how you know, stressful put, for her, yeah. Yeah, and I, so I started feeling better and better. I started noticing, you know, inflammation m- mm-hmm. more than weight. I mean, I lost a ton of weight. I was losing, you know, over a pound a day for a while. Um, That's amazing. How long did you juice fast? 
Well, my goal was 30 days. So about day 20, I mean, I had 25 pounds off by day 20. Um, and I felt fantastic. Like I felt great. Then something happened that I never thought in a million years would happen. I actually wanted to go do stuff. Like I didn't want to sit. I got bored. I got bored on the couch. At the same time, I'm I'm like, I'm getting closer to the end of 30 days. And I kind of know this is not sustainable. Like this, this is just, first of all, our whole house is filling up with pulp and it's just. <laughs> you could make books. <laughs> <laughs> Press them into vegetable pages. Well, since then, I have a huge garden with a 40-foot greenhouse, and now we we compost like machines. I was going to say, you must have a crazy compost pile. Yeah, but I knew it wasn't sustainable. And then be, because, like Netflix, because you watch Joe Cross's movie, well, Forks Over Knives came up. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Forks Over Knives did not just save my life. It gave me an entirely new life. It's a powerful film. I get yeah. chills when I hear you talk say that. Amazing, amazing film. So I watched that, and... This was the first time I've ever done this, but when the credits rolled on that, I did not buy another juicer. <laughs> I went back to the beginning and I watched the whole thing over and I'm like, this if this is real, then somebody should go to jail. Literally, right? like, you know, somebody's lying. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people are lying. A lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's criminal. It really is. Yeah. But at least it inspired us all to change. So then what happened? So were you still <laughs> on your medications now? Were you still on your pain meds? Oh, During, sure. For yeah. sure. For sure. Okay. Yeah. Lots of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> it takes a lot it, of time to come off of those, I'm sure. You know, that's why, you know, usually I see this at the beginning of an interview, but I always tell people, I'm like, I am literally just a fat guy that ate a bunch of apples. Um, <laughs> it's the truth. You know, this, there's no magic like this, this. I'm just a normal dude. So, yeah. So I screwed a lot up, you know. Um, but then so coming off the fast after watching Forks Overnight, I'm like, all right, I'm not dead. I made it 30 days with no meat, no dairy, no processed food, no sugar, no Diet Pepsi, which was like huge for me. I used to drink four liters of Diet Pepsi every day. Oh, yeah, people man. are addicted to that stuff. Yeah. It's yeah, but it's zero calories, so it doesn't count, right? Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it really does. It actually is worse, but that's my opinion. Yeah, I know. Yeah. We're not going there because yeah. I don't worry about that stuff. Um, yeah. That's the, the best neurotoxin you can get, but that's a whole yeah. other show. Yeah. Um, so I figured, well, I made it this far. What if I just try to eat what I'm putting in the juicer? I honestly didn't even know there was a thing called plant-based. Like, I had no clue. I was on an island Again, going back to that, you know, journal, we won't call it a diary, please, but <laughs> a journal at the top of it, it says, this is the first day of the rest of your life. And then I would give myself a job to do. And this sounds so crazy, but my first job was to get out of my chair twice in my office. I don't, that sounds like nuts, but I knew if I could get out of that chair once that I could do it twice. So I, people probably thought I was crazy, but I would get up out of my chair and I'd sit down and I'd get up again. <laughs> That's a squat. But sure. I love support. that. It's setting intentions, you know, writing that in a journal. This is my job that I'm going to do today. And Susie and I always talk about the power of an intention. And so you're just making it happen with your mind and putting the pen to paper. And then it, it happens. Yeah. And then the cool thing is I would come home the next night to write what I was going to do the next day. And I could check myself off. You know, mm-hmm. did, did I do it? Did I not do it? So it was kind of an accountability thing, too. You know, I started walking on that trail and I would just go a little bit farther than I had done the day before. And, you know, that three quarters of a mile turned into a couple miles. And then me and Heather would walk, you know, sometimes four mile walks after work. It started getting easier. And, you know, with the anti-inflammatory diet, the swelling started going down. Pain started, you know, subsiding somewhat. And then about the same time, I had my cousin had just got back from the Adirondack Mountains and he climbed a mountain. And I can remember telling him, I'm like, dude, I want to climb a mountain. And, you know, here I'm just trying to get out of a chair and I'm telling him I'm going to go climb a mountain. But I set a goal to climb that mountain in a year. um, And I used stairs to like train on. I would count stairs and then every day I'd try to do more stairs. And then we started hiking and kind of fast forward, it snowballed and in June 2012, I summited Big Slide Mountain. I called my doctor and I'm like, I need a brace that will bend. I went, they gave me the name of this company. They casted my leg um, and they made me this custom. It was super expensive, but they made me this like carbon fiber titanium brace. It was super high tech. The 
brace is sitting right next to me because I did a live talk the other day where I got it out and it's all beat up from the rock faces. But I got the brace made and it went up that mountain. And unfortunately, that was the last mountain it went up because the next 10 or so I did, I didn't need it. I was strong enough. So good for you. And then the cool thing is I came home. I like the mountain so much. I brought my family back and we actually did a couple high peaks together. So little by little, you know, my wife went plant based and she lost like 60 pounds. Wow. Um, so what happened is the more I did, the more I wanted to do, the cleaner I ate, the better I felt. I think it all kind of worked together um, as far as the drugs. Um, what I did is I, and I do not suggest this to any of your listeners. Don't do this. But I got off the fentanyl myself, and I definitely should have went to a clinic for it. Yeah. But how I did it is when I put a patch on every three days, I would measure just like an eighth of an inch. I would take a slice off the patch, and I would just wear the remainder of it. And then every three days, I would take another eighth inch off. And it took forever mm -hmm. until one day I went to put the patch on, and I was using actually the eighth inch part. I was able to get off the fentanyl, and to this day, I don't know, three, four years later, um, I still have the box, and the first thing I look at in the morning was them, and I'm like, you know, that was my battle every day, and I'd face it and fight it, and, you know, I knew that to this day, I still fight the same addiction battles, whether it's food or anything else. So that's kind of how I got off the medicine end of it. Yeah, and then all my numbers started getting better, and... Um, I got a bicycle and I wanted to do a hundred mile bike ride. Um, and I hadn't been on a bike, you know, in 20 years. I'm like, people actually ride a hundred miles in a few hours. I mean, that's crazy. Um, so I signed up for one. Um, my sister has multiple sclerosis, so it's a good cause. I signed up for one and I'm like, I don't have a bike. So I got my bike delivered eight weeks before the hundred miler and, uh, we finished it. You know, me and my wife's sister did that. My wife's not really into the bike thing, but yeah, so I did a hundred miler in eight weeks, never been on a bike. So that was cool. That's amazing, by the way. Yeah, it was, it was fun. It's a blast. And the Buffalo full marathon was coming up and I'm like, I'm going to take a stab at a full marathon. And I'm not supposed to be walking, you know, like yeah. so I'm going to try a full marathon. We've been doing all these crazy things. We're going to go run the race in Leadville in a couple months here um i'm training for iron man wow. Um, wow that's so cool the so coolest you just... thing of all this stuff this is the coolest thing ever but yeah so we do some cool things we do a lot of adventures our, our marriage you know we didn't have a bad marriage before but it's definitely more exciting and adventurous now. i bet i can imagine so you help other people now too I do. I love doing that. I love that more than my own story. But yeah. And I have a question. So when you you did the juice, the juice fast, and then you went plant based and what made you not go back? Why did you stick to the vegan diet? What were what were the reasons? Like, honestly, like this is going to be a terrible answer, but I'd rather die than go back. Um, that's a wonderful answer. I mean, it's honest. I, honest. Yeah. Because I think when you, you know how, when you have something wrong with your car, but it's not really wrong and then you get it fixed and it's like, holy crap, that was terrible. I think that's how I was. I didn't realize how I was supposed to feel. Once I started eating healthy and getting rid of all the meds and, you know, all the escapes that I had and really experience life. I think I realized how bad, how bad I really was, like how terrible it really felt to get up in the morning. I can't sleep till five, like four fifty. I jump out of bed. Like I, I feel like a kid at Christmas every single morning. I can't wait to get out of bed. We need to be proactive in our health, and every single person should be responsible for their own health. Like they shouldn't put it on the doctor. The doctors, they have their purpose, but these chronic diseases that most of them stem from inflammation. That's, you know, we can find out what foods cause that. But the bottom line is this. People need to get, you know, their doctors off these pedestals and realize that health is your responsibility, not your doctors. Absolutely. 
All right, Food Heals Nation, I hope you're feeling motivated and inspired based on the last few stories that you've heard in today's episode, as well as the previous episodes that have been a part of this wellness and weight loss series. I know for me, it was really fun to go back and listen to a lot of these episodes again to choose the clips that I wanted to play. I was getting super fired up and super excited and super inspired to, and even to remember some of the things that I had forgotten that I wanted to incorporate into my wellness routine. So I hope you're feeling as fired up as I was when I was, you know, looking for the clips and putting these episodes together. So I want to make sure that you guys know exactly what is in my course, Food Freedom, which is at dropthefoodshame.com, which, you know, I've been talking about on the last few episodes. But I wanted to take you kind of behind the scenes so that you can hear about some of the classes and practices and meditations that Food Freedom will share that I'm going to teach you. Um, in the course. So food freedom will take you on a physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual healing journey. So in week one, we're really going to dive deep into how to end emotional eating and heal your relationship with food. So the first thing we're going to do is some radical goal setting so that we can manifest our success from day one so that we come at it from the correct mindset, vibrate at a place of joy and excitement and not at a place of, oh, I have to do this or this is hard or this is never going to work. So we're going to start out really positive and joyful and excited for the process. We're going to talk about mindfulness of how you're eating, of your food-related emotional habits. Then we're going to really go back and delve deep into some of the traumas that we've had as children or sometimes older, like my trauma was primarily in my 20s, although we all have childhood trauma, but my major trauma were, were in my 20s. So you're going to go back to the time that you have unresolved issues from, and you're going to turn that trauma into triumph. You're going to turn that pain into purpose. And that's going to help you by healing the past. It's going to help you with your emotional eating, you know, issues today, right? Everything we heal in the past automatically heals in our present. So I've got some really great advice and tools and practices for that. We're going to cultivate a really powerful self-forgiveness process so we can forgive ourselves of all the judgments that we've made about ourselves, about others, and about the world. This is really important because once you let go of everything you're holding against yourself, you're like, oh, I don't need to judge myself. I'm effing amazing. And that's the place that I want to get you to, right? And we're going to talk about how to track your emotions. I love food journey journaling. You know, I love the write and burn. There's so many tools I'm going to teach you. And then I've got a beautiful meditation in this one. And that is by Marissa, one of our, my favorite uh, meditation teachers. And I listen to her podcast all of the time, Incandescent. It used to be called the Midday Meditation Pump Up Podcast, but she changed the name Incandescent. And she made a meditation specifically for us, for, specifically for everyone who is trying to heal the wounds of their past to cultivate self-love in our present and in our future. In week two, we're going to talk about dropping the body shame for good, loving your food, your body, and yourself. So we're going to talk about the tools to drop the body shame, to stop shaming ourselves, and to shop stop shaming others, frankly, because it's like when we're shaming others, it's just a reflection of how we feel about ourselves anyway. So let's be positive about ourselves and positive about others as well. And also there's a beautiful meditation in this one created by Katie Kremitzos, who is my other favorite meditation teacher. You know her. She's been on multiple episodes of this show and she has the Women's Meditation Network and she has overcome body shame and lost hundreds of pounds as well. And she she teaches us how to create a loving relationship with your body at any size. Then we're going to get into some of the physical stuff. So how to discover the perfect diet for your body so that you're eating foods that nourish you and fuel you and not foods that are just comforting you eating to live and not living to eat. Then we're going to go into alternative medicine healing practices that you can incorporate into your weekly routine. These are things that you may not have heard of. These are things that are cutting edge. These are biohacks. These are things to get your body healthy at the next level. I love this part of the course. It's my favorite thing to talk about. So I can't wait to get 
deep with you on those. And then we're going to go into one of my favorite practices that everyone can be doing on a regular basis. This is one of the most healing tools to have in your healing toolbox. That's the write and burn. This is the powerful process of uncovering unlocked emotions, letting it out so you can finally feel peace and joy on a regular daily basis basis. And this one ends with a beautiful meditation by Food Heals co-host Susie Hardy that the body can heal itself. So on the weight loss journey, when you're losing weight, you're healing your body. When you're healing your body, you're usually losing weight. So these things go hand in hand. So this is a meditation you can do on a regular basis to teach your body how to heal. You can do it every day. You can do it every night. It's totally up to you. In week three, we go into how to find food freedom with your new emotional healing toolbox. So Number one is we're really going to talk about manifestation and how to manifest your desires from a place of joy and not fear. Because a lot of us know what the law of attraction is, but we're not using it to our advantage. We know it exists. We think, oh, think positive and good things will come to us. But we're constantly being negative and we're constantly going, I can't do this. And we're constantly in this endless cycle where we're having more negativity than positivity. And therefore, we're manifesting more of the things that we don't want rather than the things that we do. So I've got a step-by-step process that is guaranteed to teach you how to manifest your desires from a place of joy and not fear, how to vibrate at such a high frequency that the universe can't help but to, to deliver exactly what it is that you want, okay? So this is one of my favorite courses as well. Um, The next thing we're going to talk about is how to eat, how to practice grace and self-love with every single meal. I've got a step-by-step process for this as well. Then we're going to go to how to boost your mood so that we're not in a cycle of negativity. So there are foods that you can eat on a regular basis and incorporate into your diet for ultimate health and wellness and boost your brain and boost your mood and give you those feel-good chemicals, right? Then we're going to go into the must-have supplements that you need to keep you in a good mood that will keep your gut healthy, that will keep your brain healthy and firing so that you can stay on this journey and stay in a positive mindset. They say the gut is the second brain, so we want to keep our guts healthy, we want to keep our brains healthy, and that's going to get us out of the cycle of negativity, of the cycle of bad, horrible thinking, of the cycle of shame and self-judgment. Um, The next class is how to set yourself up for success moving forward. So when the three weeks is over, now you've got all the tools, what are you going to do with them? Well, you're going to keep practicing. Healing is a journey. Once we lose the weight, you know, what we don't want to do is go back to the old habits, right? So this is going to help you set yourself up for lasting success, lasting changes. And then we're going to wrap up with another beautiful meditation from Susie Hardy, on how to be the love that you seek because it really does all come down to self-love and all of the practices and tools in this course are really about getting to that place of self-love and there's so many ways to get there and so you'll see which of the practices and tools really resonate with you and you'll start practicing them on a regular basis and you will truly start to cultivate create food freedom and create that body that you want and create a loving relationship with your food, with yourself and with your body. And the last thing, you'll get all the recommended resources that I've used and that I recommend throughout the course to continue creating a spiritually aligned relationship to food. So check it out. It's all at dropthefoodshame.com. I hope to see you there, Food Heals Nation. All right. See you next time, Food Heals Nation. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, developing a more positive outlook on life. In rare cases, women have experienced a strong desire to stop asking their boyfriends if they look fat in this dress. If you experience any of these symptoms, post a selfie to Instagram immediately.